Okay. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank very much uh, the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to this fantastic uh, uh, conference. It has been really, really great talks. Um, I will uh, talk about um, a work that we uh, submitted and actually was actually uh, accepted in physical reviews research very recently. And this is, uh, uh, the title is Efficient Assimilatability of Continuous Variable Circuits with uh, Large Wigner Negativity. Um, and if I have uh, one minute time left at the end, I will also speak about this uh, second paper that is uh, listed here. Uh, that is also submitted recently, where the title is not exactly that, but it could read like efficient simulatability of continuous variable cir circuits with a small Wigner negativity. I hope I can speak a little bit about that as well. By the way, yes, I, I didn't mention, but I come from Sweden, um, uh, from Chalmers, and uh, I belong to the VACT Center, so this Wallenberg Center for Quantum Technologies. Uh, okay. So let me start by uh, mentioning who uh, my collaborators are. Uh, so the main person for the first paper I mentioned is Laura Garcia Alvarez and then Cameron Kalkluth, also a PhD student in my group has helped and he, I believe he is in the audience now. Uh, and then Alessandro Ferraro is my collaborator from Belfast. Uh, and then for the second paper, uh, so it stems from a collaboration uh, from the Paris team. I've been interacting a lot in the past. Uh, uh, and I, I saw yesterday that uh, uh, Frederica was in the audience um, and Ulisse Chabot is the main person then. Um, okay, so the framework of this talk is uh, uh, in the stream of ideas where people try to understand what are the resources for quantum advantage with bosonic or continuous variable circuits in this case. And in particular, um, we ask if, uh, so we all know that uh, the Wigner negativity uh, in bosonic systems is a necessary condition for quantum advantage, uh, but is it also sufficient? Um, we are going to see a couple of examples so, uh, uh, where the answer is very clearly no, because there are uh, circuits that do have a large Wigner negativity, uh, and yet they are classically efficiently simulatable and those will have GKP states. So this is why this work connects to, to, the, uh, to the workshop. Um, then uh, uh, maybe some people might say, okay, for me, it was not obvious. I mean, I had not seen clearly stated this, uh, found a counter example where circuits with a high Wigner negativity are efficiently simulatable in the literature before, but in case you had, um, then in, well, the, the actual scientific question that uh, is underlying our work uh, is addressing like specific architecture that are non-trivial to assess in terms of simulatability or computational hardness. And then, um, and this is actually what has uh, started this work. So, and uh, yeah, I will come to this. Uh, and uh, the, the spoiler is that uh, if uh, a circuit like this one with input GKP state and the rest of the circuit is Gaussian is simulatable or not, it actually depends on the circuit. Uh, Okay, but uh, before going to the details, let me take a little bit of a detour and introduce uh, uh, something that probably everybody knows, but it's good to be all on the same pace. Um, namely the Wigner function. Uh, it is a representation of quantum system in classical phase space, and it's given by this expression. So it's associated to the density matrix of the system. And it allows, for instance, to, to visualize the coherent states uh, and squeeze states as these Gaussians. And there, there can be states that uh, have a non-Gaussian Wigner function, for instance, single photon states or photon subtracted states or even GKP states, as we're going to see in a moment. And with this, one can also represent in phase space not only states, but also evolution and measurements by replacing uh, this in this expression, uh, the density matrix with the corresponding matrices. Um, and now, so there is this uh, um, famous Nogo theorem um, that was uh, like one version of it was put forward by Marian Eisert in 2012 that says that uh, if uh, in a quantum circuit, in a bosonic quantum circuit, all the elements are in terms of input state, gates and measurement, they are all described by positive inner functions, then there cannot be 
quantum advantage in terms of the one that you need for the Shor algorithm, meaning the exponential type, you might still have quadratic uh, speed up, but uh, here we talk about uh, exponential advantage and that you cannot have without a negative Wigner function. So Wigner negativity is necessary uh, to implement a non-trivial quantum computation in this sense. And this in turn implies that you have to have a non-Gaussian element in your circuit because all Gaussian processes are described by positive Wigner function. Okay, but then uh, what can be a minimal extension of a Gaussian circuit that can give quantum advantage? And if you think about boson sampling is actually a little bit overkill in terms of this uh, Wigner negativity because both the input uh, which is single photon states and the output, which are like photon number detection, are both described by positive, by negative Wigner functions. So then a couple of years ago, we were studying a lot uh, these minimal extensions of uh, uh, Gaussian circuits um, that have some non-Gaussian element and yet yield this kind of quantum superiority type of experiments like boson sampling. And there, the non-Gaussian element can be either the input state or the evolution or the detection only. So in the first uh, um, family of uh, circuits, we were uh, addressing boson sampling with heterodyne detection and showing that this is actually uh, hard to sample for a classical computer. It means that it takes an exponential time for a classical computer to produce outputs, samples that are distributed like the outcomes of uh, the measurements of this circuit. Um, uh, and then uh, an alternative uh, family uh, is given by these uh, uh, circuits where the evolution is uh, non-Gaussian and then you can have Gaussian uh, input and measurement like homodyne detection and squeeze state. Uh, and this, uh, an example of these circuits was this instance, the inter instantaneous quantum computing circuits in continuous variable. And then at the end, uh, one can also consider uh, boson sampling with uh, input squeeze states uh, and this is, has also been shown to be hard to sample. And uh, Steve yesterday has presented some architecture that allows to uh, estimate the Frank Condon profile of vibronic molecular spectra. And this is exactly the same kind of architectures. So then it means that uh, it seems that uh, even if your full circuit is not non-Gaussian, but you have a little uh, negativity in terms of only one element, then you can have something non-trivial. Um, some, some quantum advantage. And then another uh, kind of result that was developed by Bartlett and collaborators was to show that uh, uh, relative to a specific kind of algorithm uh, that was similar to Monte Carlo, uh, where they were able to treat the, the sign problem, um, they were exhibiting a running time of their simulation algorithm that was really scaling exponentially with the Wigner negativity. Uh, Wigner logarithmic negativity of the quantum circuit. And then this was really establishing a direct link between Wigner negativity and the classical computational cost. So from this kind of result, one can have the question, okay, but then is it Wigner negativity sufficient for quantum advantage? Uh, and then um, uh, we could actually uh, quite soon realize that uh, quite trivially, the answer is no. Uh, and when it comes to trivial counterexample, it's uh, it's really easy to see that you know, there can be indeed um, circuits that do have a large Wigner negativity and yet are simulatable. So let's let's take a look at this. Um, so the 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 key idea for like uh, unveiling a trivial example, a trivial counterexample, is to take another important result by. Uh, Dan Gottesman, who spoke yesterday at the panel discussion. Uh, but this time, this is the gottesman nil theorem, and it's a qubit result. Is the uh, discrete variable analog of the Mariaiser theorem that I mentioned before, based on the Wigner function. This one is instead um, based on the following. So you take a, a qubit quantum computation, where the states are initialized in eigenstates of the Pauli matrices, those, those uh, poles of the block sphere. And then you take Clifford group operations. So the Clifford group is generated by the Hadamar, the phase gate and the CNOT or the CZ, what, uh, whatever uh, untangling gate um, would do. And then you have Pauli measurements. Um, and then uh, this can be, if you have a quantum circuit that is built like this for qubits, you can simulate it efficiently with a classical computer, like for positive Wigner function states. 
Then uh, uh, one trivial example, if you want to build an example of a circuit that has a large Wigner negativity and yet is simulatable, you can do like this. You can take uh, this uh, gottesman nil theorem and you can code such a circuit uh, characterized by uh, qubit initializing poly eigenstates, Clifford group operation and poly measurements with GKP encoding. So how does that look like? So in the conference, uh, uh, we have heard a lot about the, um, the GKP states, um, say that the, for qubit, the zero logical state is this uh, blue comb, and then uh, the one logical state is this uh, uh, orange comb that is uh, shifted uh, um, by a multiple square root of pi with respect to the first one. Um, and then these are our, 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 our input states. And uh, as it was already uh, stated in the original GKP paper in 2001, uh, the Wigner function of the states is highly non-negative and you have, uh, it's, it's characterized by delta peaks basically. And then you have uh, one fourth of the delta peaks that are negative and one fourth that are uh, positive for the zero and one logical uh, states. And then uh, Laura has computed uh, uh, the Wigner function of uh, general uh, encoded GKP states in a proceeding of this uh, um, conference paper. Uh, so we have our input state. Then what about the Clifford operations encoded in GKP states? Uh, so in, these are also quite easy because they are all described by Gaussian operations as also was uh, already stated in the, uh, in the GKP paper. Um, so, and then uh, the Hadamard transformation uh, maps to the Fourier transform that is quadratic like this. And you have this Q square plus P square. Then uh, the phase maps into this uh, share operation Q square, and then uh, the CZ gate maps into Q1, Q2. Uh, and then uh, the Pauli operators are just given by these uh, shifts. And this is very easy to understand. Uh, take a look to this. Uh, the, what should a Pauli operator do uh, on qubit? It should transform zero to one. And then in terms of on GKP encoding, this means that we want to shift our blue comb to the orange comb. And this is clearly uh, realized by this uh, shift uh, generated by this uh, P operator here. So then we have our Clifford operations encoded in, um, in GKP. And then finally, for the measurement, the, the Pauli measurements are clearly, uh, they can be implemented by homodyne, which is also a Gaussian operation. So the bottom line of this is that uh, if you want to construct a trivial counterexample where uh, a circuit is highly Wigner negative because the Wigner function of the GKP states is highly Wigner negative, and yet the circuit is efficiently simulatable due to, due to the gottes manuel theorem, you can take this uh, uh, Clifford circuit and encode them in continuous variable and then measure with the modine and you're done. And this is not particularly surprising. But then the question that we were really addressing in this work was the following. Consider now the case where instead of having a Clifford operations encoded in GKP, you instead take uh, continuous displacements uh, where this doesn't anymore correspond to an encoded qubit operation in GKP because you go out of the qubit computational subspace because this S might not correspond to a multiple of pi or square root of pi. And then uh, uh, this, uh, we believe that it's really non-trivial to address because on the one hand, the gottesman nil theorem cannot apply, be applicable anymore because the operations um, are outside the qubit subspace. And in the same time, the Mariaizer theorem cannot be applicable anymore because the Wigner function in the input state is highly negative. So how do you know if the circuit is simulatable or it's hard to sample? Uh, then uh, the idea to tackle this, at least in, uh, in several cases, um, has been put forward by Laura. So uh, she um, suggested to interpret the displacements outside the qubit computational subspace as Clifford operations in a higher uh, qubit uh, space. So basically the idea is that if instead of uh, logical GKP qubits, you encode uh, uh, qubits, uh, like you use the, the, the same GKP comb, but then uh, to encode a qubit instead of a qubit, then the spacing is different and the highest the dimension of the qubit that you want to encode, the smaller the, the shift that you need to do to go from the zero to the one um, logical and two logical state and so on. So the smaller uh, the shift you need to have a Clifford operations encoded in high dimensional qubits. 
Um, and then uh, what uh, she suggested to do is the following. So you have your uh, state where your, your circuit, where you have your input uh, qubit states, then you can basically interpret your, your, interpret your qubit state as if it was a state of a qubit in a higher dimensional state. You also have to make sure that if you start with a stabilizer state, you also end up with a stabilizer state, which is the case. And then for instance, here I plotted this uh, pictorial representation of how the, the zero logical qubit state can be represented uh, or interpreted in terms of a, a zero plus four state in a qubit um, encoding where d is equal to eight in this case. And uh, yeah, with qubit, uh, uh, with GKP uh, qubit and qubit encodings, this is really an identity between wave functions. Um, and then uh, the result that we obtained is that uh, for all the family of circuits where you have input GKP states and then uh, uh, qubit. And then uh, here you have displacement that are beyond the, the qubit ones, uh, but they, they still have the form of an arbitrary rational that multiplies the square root of pi. And this can be uh, arbitrarily small. So they, in this sense, they approach the, the continuum, but uh, even if they are like uh, uh, associated to these rational numbers, uh, then uh, you can interpret uh, uh, these uh, uh, finer displacements like uh, displace Clifford operations in a QDIT uh, space, and then conclude that these specific architectures are indeed the classically efficiently simulatable due to the extensions of the Gottesman Nil theorems to QDITs and to higher dimensions. So this is a, a, a result. I still would like to mention that the, the result for the general uh, displacement, the continuous one is still open. Uh, I mean, the question is still open. We still don't know what happens if you really have all the rationals somehow. Uh, sorry, all the reals. Uh, real. For the rationals, it's okay, it's simulatable. Um, okay, several people asked us about the consequences of this. Uh, maybe the, since many people use the GKP states and codes in the context of error correction, uh, they were, they had like a, uh, a question as to whether then quantum error correcting architectures uh, are trivial. And this is not the case because most probably your encoded uh, uh, qubit in GKP encoding is most probably not in a stabilizer state. Um, so uh, then uh, you, you shouldn't be worried that this is not a conclusion about the triviality of your quantum computation if you're trying to do that fault tolerantly just because you use GKP states. Um, and another point that I wanted to make is that it's still possible to uh, use to uh, use GKP states in combination with a Gaussian circuit to quant for quantum superiority type of experiments uh, and to show quantum advantage. And there, you know, as much as we encoded uh, uh, a, a circuit that was in the hypothesis of the gottesman nil theorem to obtain a trivial circuit, then you can encode with GKP um, a circuit that has been shown to be hard to sample for qubits. For example, that were a very interesting result by Yodza, Yonagatan, and uh, Strelshuk in this uh, uh, proceeding of the Royal Society, where they have a, a circuit for qubits that is going given by T states. So these are magic states. They have this, uh, they are not stabilizer state. They are this uh, uh, phase here between the zero and one component. Uh, and then uh, uh, Clifford operations and Pauli measurements. So if you encode that one uh, in, um, in GKP, in continuous variable then with GKP encoding, then you get a hard to sample circuit. So it's still very interesting to use GKP states even for quantum superiority type of experiment with, with Gaussian circuits. Um, then uh, um, Laura had also the idea of uh, extending these uh, results by playing the same game uh, in the context of uh, rotationally symmetric bosonic codes or GCB uh, codes from Grismo, Combs and Barajola who put them forward in this uh, or systematize them in this very nice uh, paper who, that recently appeared. And here you can basically do the same thing you can interpret your um, qubit encoded in RSB with a certain rotational symmetry uh, as uh, the sum of two code words in a higher dimensional, uh, in a qubit, in a uh, so in a rotational symmetric qubit. Uh, uh, then here, the, the black spot represents uh, minus phases. So it's quite clear that when you sum these two code words, there will be a simplification and then you obtain this uh, encoded qubit. 
And then uh, uh, the conclusion of this is that if you map now um, this into uh, encoded uh, uh, circuits, so um, so you can have uh, uh, your initial uh, uh, qubit in encoded in RSB, and then you, here you can have operations that can be uh, qubit operations uh, in a higher dimensional space. And here you, your phase measurement. And then uh, Cameron and Laura uh, really characterize precisely what are all these operations that become then, uh, were, were for which it is possible to conclude on the simulatability. And now, because uh, for rotational bosonic code is not true anymore, like uh, for GKP codes, that the Clifford operations of the gottes manil theorem map into uh, Gaussian operations, here you get a simulatability result where even the circuit itself is highly non-Gaussian. Um, yes. Uh, okay, so this is uh, almost uh, the, the end of the talk. I just have, uh, as I promised in the beginning, one remaining slide on a, a parent result. Uh, uh, no, how do, we, how do you do this in, uh, in English? Like a relative uh, a connected result uh, uh, because it's always in the stream of ideas of what is simulatable or not when you take a Gaussian circuit and you plug some non-Gaussian state in the input. And then here with the Paris team, we were looking at uh, circuits where you have like um, some input uh, uh, single photon states and the rest of the circuit is Gaussian. Basically, this is like considering uh, uh, boson sampling, but with uh, uh, heterodyne detection. And then what we were showing is that if uh, the number of single photons that you have in input is uh, uh, of the order of logarithm of the total number of modes, then the circuit is also classically efficiently simulatable. And the proof technique here is totally different from, from what I showed before, and is instead based on the fact that the output probability distribution is uh, of this type of circuits is um, proportional to the Hafnian of the matrix described in the circuit itself. The Hafnian is another, um, is associated to matrices as much as the permanent is another property of matrices. And computing the Hafnian is uh, exponential in the size of the relevant matrix. And here the relevant matrix size uh, is the same uh, number as the how many uh, single photons you have. And then if you have a logarithmic number of single photons, then you have a computational time that is exponential in a logarithm. And then you recover an efficient uh, computation basically of the Hafnian and then you can uh, simulate the circuits. Uh, and instead, if uh, the number of photons that you have is rather linear in the number of modes, then the circuit is hard to sample. And this was the result of um, uh, boson sampling with heterodyne measurement that I also mentioned briefly at the beginning of the talk. So yeah, with this, uh, I can conclude. Um, so we have uh, shown that uh, some architectures that are composed of input GKP states and then uh, Gaussian circuit where the Gaussian are operations that we consider are all the Clifford encoded plus all the very, very fine displacements that you get by uh, considering a QDIT. So this like Clifford operations in a higher QDIT space as high as you want. Uh, those are simulatable. For general Gaussian circuits, we don't know. It's still an open question and I'm very happy to discuss it if someone wants to, to take the discussion offline, even uh, in the question, of course, but I, 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 I still, I don't know. Um, and then also we show that some circuit with a few uh, non-Gaussian elements are simulatable. So we can basically conclude that the Wigner negativity is not sufficient for quantum advantage, as it is maybe not very surprising. Um, but then uh, uh, in general, if uh, some input non-Gaussian states make a Gaussian circuit hard to sample or not, depends on the non-Gaussian states, but also uh, on the circuit that you consider. Um, and with this, I can uh, thank again my collaborators for, uh, yeah, for the nice time uh, spent working together and the nice results and all of you for your attention. Thank you, Julia. So maybe everyone can thank uh, Julia virtually. Um, yeah, this is, it's really a fascinating talk and thanks so much for agreeing to give it. Um, I have some questions. I, I just might see if anyone, uh, does no. Um, so I'm sure they'll flow in as I start to ask my question. So I wanted to ask you sort of flipping 
maybe flipping your results a little bit, um, we see that, you know, it's really important to understand which circuits are simulable and hard, or I mean, easy and hard for demonstrating um, superiority. Um, one of the interesting things I think about bosonic systems is that, you know, whatever you're doing, the Hilbert space is large, whether you're trying to do things in the position basis or in the Fock basis. And so it's often difficult to uh, simulate uh, you know, realistic error channels on these things, so propagations and, and error correction. So that's one really nice thing about qubits, that the Hilbert space is small, so you can easily simulate, you know, 20 qubits on a laptop. But like simulating three um, bosonic modes on a laptop is a nightmare. And so I've kind of wondered if you've ever thought about flipping the question around and trying to find ways of um, efficiently simulating uh, uh, circuits that we want to use in error correction, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I what I can comment in two ways. One is that uh, indeed uh, I've seen appearing in our on archive recently uh, papers where at least in the context of uh, boson sampling, you know, there is a race as much as for other type of uh, quantum computing architecture. The race is that not only uh, people try to build a larger boson sampler uh, and do like uh, like the Google experiment. For instance, there is this leader group in, in China where they have uh, many, many modes, but also uh, the people who simulate these circuits, they also try to make the simulation better. And yes, I've seen results recently, I think by Montanaro or uh, other people who improve constantly their techniques of simulations of bosonic systems. Uh, and for boson sampling, it's really a race and the, the trash where it becomes intractable has been already pushed forward uh, several times and it's still an active field of research. Uh, and then when it comes to specific techniques, I, I recently um, learned something from Shruti uh, because uh, she, uh, she taught me uh, that uh, I think that this is uh, already published in some of her papers uh, where she has a technique uh, that is called the Pauli transfer matrix formalism. Uh, where you are interested in uh, um, encoded architectures, when you can actually map your uh, errors that uh, occur in the computation into the computational subspace, where effectively then you end up uh, dealing with fewer um, levels than uh, uh, all the Fox space that you need to characterize your bosonic mode. So this is something uh, um, on which I'm trying to put the hands at the moment, but. Um, uh, so due this to, is like using the encoding isometry and sandwiching the channel either side so that you now effectively got a qubit channel. Yeah, exactly. Precise, yes. So yeah, exactly. So this I learned from her recently um, because we are uh, uh, yeah, uh, chit-chatting a bit about these topics. And um, yeah, um, and otherwise, uh, as I was saying, when it becomes architecture dependent, for example, boson sampling, yeah, there are um, people are, it's an active field of research. And uh, at least for boson sampling, there are a lot of results. Okay. Uh, let's see, any questions in the chat? No. Um, okay, I'll ask uh, one last one. And um, before we move on, I just want to uh, point out, we're going to take a 15 minute break after this talk. And then there's two more talks and the session concludes and the conference concludes. So uh, please stay around. The last two talks look fascinating. Um, Shruti, did you have a question or? No, okay. Um, so my question was, um, if you could uh, like wave a magic wand and tomorrow in the archive, uh, a result could appear that would uh, solve your uh, deepest problem. What would you like? I mean, what kind of um, results in this area would you like to see? Okay, that's a secret because we are like a Oh, you're about to do something? <laughs> okay, well, look, there's a better, there's a better question yeah. anyway here. Um, are, there, um, are there interesting non-exponential speed up problems that CV systems can calculate? Uh, well, you can map uh, uh, any problem that you like in CV. Uh, so of course uh, there are problems. So there are, for instance, uh, algorithm that have uh, less than exponential advantage, uh, for instance, uh, Grover, um, algorithm and those uh, you can definitely map uh, in CV and you can choose your favorite encoding. And then one question that, okay, this I maybe can say, it's also a, a potentially research question that I, uh, we might in the future also want to address. But if somebody knows uh, or wants to discuss, also this will be very nice to see tomorrow in the archive. So what if you do that? You take um, the Grover algorithm, you take an encoding that is, um, 
uh, even uh, something that, for instance, doesn't require necessarily negative inner functions at the level of the logical code words. But then uh, uh, do you need um, at some point negative ignore function to, to see the quantum advantage or not at the quadratic level? Because in the Mari Eisert uh, theorem, um, quadratic advantages are not, uh, I mean, excluded by uh, the theorem, even if uh, the Wigner function is positive everywhere. So one question that I would have is, is if it's possible to have this kind of quadratic advantages with a uh, positive Wigner function everywhere, for example. This uh, seems interesting, but yes, you can map, uh, yeah, definitely whatever algorithm that has been shown for qubit to have a quadratic speed up like Grover uh, into a continuous variable. Yeah, that would be certainly very interesting. Um, okay, well, let's thank uh, Julia again, and we're gonna take a 15 minute break and we'll come back and uh, finish off the uh, conference and the session. So thank you again, Julia. And um, hopefully you get to meet in person sometime. <laughs> Um, sh I should stop share the screen. I was, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go make a coffee, but otherwise I'm just going to be hanging out here and I'm happy to chat to anyone. Uh, oh, uh, actually, I was just typing a question for you, Julia. Yes. Um, maybe I can just ask. Um, so is there, a, even for regular computing, is there a theorem that says that for quadratic advantage, you don't need, uh, say, um, Clifford Gates? Uh, good question. Yeah, it actually, it's the same question, but asked, it's the same uh, question. Yeah, but I'm just asking yeah, it for yeah. yeah. I, I never thought about it. And I never saw this. I, I believe. Uh, I mean, this is really, you know, there is so much literature on Clifford circuits. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly, I've mostly seen uh, results about the simulatability of Clifford circuits, maybe yeah. the simulatability of Clifford circuits with some uh, non-Clifford non operation. So it's the mm -hmm. reverse. But the quantum advantage we've only, ah, yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know the answer. Okay, yes, uh, th there was a, a thesis, uh, it's not a, um, maybe a master thesis of somebody in Lund mm -hmm. in the group of uh, um, uh, Janu Klarsson uh, that I can send to you because I have the PDF. And he was uh, uh, writing down the full expression for all the, uh, uh, Groover and uh, some other kind of circuits with, uh, but I don't know what gate he had. Uh, if he only had uh, Clifford or if he also had uh, non-Clifford operations. But I think I, I have a, a PDF of a thesis where there might be some hints. Uh, I'm not sure actually. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's the question. If you can, uh, say, do the Grover algorithm and get your quadratic speed up with Clifford operations. Yeah, let's, uh, I, I will I will check the thesis of this, uh, of this oh, guy. I, I think Dan is saying something. I don't think there is, because it is very hard to prove lower bounds. Okay. Uh, is there a reply? Yeah, from Dan. Can you not see it? Uh, not in the chat, but, ah, yes, I don't think this is really no, because this is very hard to prove lower bounds. Okay, can I, oh, yeah, wow. looks like I can unmute. So yeah. There is, there is a result about um, depth. You can get uh, kind of a sort of advantage. It's a different kind of advantage with low depth Clifford group circuits mm -hmm. by um, Bravi, don't remember, he had a collaborator at least. Oh, uh, Bravi and Gossett. Uh, okay, Koenig maybe, or? Ko Possibly, mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me just look it up. Yeah, is the hidden? Uh... Bravi, Koenig, Gossett. Yeah. yeah, is it hidden quadratic uh, function problem, right? Yeah. So, but uh, the but for the straight circuit complexity, I don't think it's known. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But where does the circuits Clifford in that paper? No, it was no. not. No, it's the depth that it was known to be low. Yeah, the depth is known to be low. That's yeah. right. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think it's really an interesting question. It's surprising because there is so much literature in trying to prove the, the contrary, like the simulatability, and not so much literature in trying to prove the advantage mm -hmm. with the Clifford uh, circuits. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, 
one part, one partly answer, one answer, like, uh, you know, take your paper, uh, Shruti, the network communication. Mm -hmm. There you start with this uh, plus alpha, minus alpha, mm -hmm. and then those have a positive inner function. And then uh, you go at the end of, uh, of the annealing, uh, you do quantum annealing, and, and then uh, you... Um, you no, end I mean, up... I start with the vacuum state, which has positive Wigner function, and then I go to coherent states, which yes, also exactly. have positive Wigner functions. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And in the middle, though, you have a negative Wigner function that appear quite spontaneously. That's right. Uh, even if uh, I don't know uh, the kind of the specific problem that you considered, but um, so I don't know if one can already state that. Uh, yeah. Daniel, I don't know if you're still there, but has any of this inspired you to think about these kinds of things again, or are you? Uh... Well, I mean, I, I was interested in Julia's question about uh, simulating PKP input in Gaussian states. And I started to write an email saying it was completely straightforward, but as I thought about it a little bit more, it's not completely straightforward. Um, I think the, the arbitrary displacements could just follow from the proof um, the qubit proof, but if you start to do really arbitrary Gaussians, then I'm not sure. Hmm. How would the continuous displacement follow directly? Well, uh, you, just, you just write down the stabilizer, right? Which is e to the i, you know, p, e to the i, a p, e to the i, a q. And if you do a continuous displacement, that just changes the phase out front, right? Mm -hmm. One or both of those. Um, what I'm worried about is when you do Gaussian operations, then you can get stabilizers of the form that are, you know, sums of P to some power, well, not P to some power, but P gets, hmm, maybe it's okay. You get sums of P's and Q's that you have to keep track of. Um, maybe that's okay. I'm just worried that there could be some increase in complexity, but you can't get P to any power except, except inverses. If you squeeze. You know, you know, there was, I don't know if you have seen uh, Daniel, but there was a, a result by Nick Mericucci and Barajola um, about uh, taking a GKP state that was like uh, uh, in a zero logical state. And then because you entangle it with vacuum uh, that is con resourceless mm -hmm. from the continuous variable perspective. Yeah, but then, uh, yeah. And, and there you, you get a magic state uh, in the computational subspace at the end. So uh, that's why it, it, it might be not completely uh, uh, innocent to act with uh, Gaussian yeah. operations on stabilizer. I mean, uh, the vacuum state. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I was talking about was the ideal GKP state. And the vacuum state is not, it's not a stabilizer state, right, in the same way. Yes. So that's. So it's actually, in some sense, the vacuum state that's doing the work there of the, yeah. the weird operation. I mean, it's, I, yeah, I mean, I see your point that that seems like that could be innocuous, but. But um, uh, actually, you know, then there was this paper by Steve that he was generalizing the stabilizer to the case of finite squeezing. And there uh, you could say that the vacuum is uh, the, the maximally non-squeezed, uh, you know, um, so it's also the limit uh, of zero squeezing uh, of a GKP state somehow. So, right, so then, right. uh, uh, but, but in that sense, if I take the paper by Steve, plus the fact that uh, you can take the limit of uh, zero squeezing, one might also have stabilizer, but then I don't know if in that limit, uh, you will lose uh, some property. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, but, but they are stabilizer in the, I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, the stabilizer is different, right? So it's, now I, now I have to worry about what happens to it with the Gaussian operations. But your idea would be to basically track the stabilize. I mean, track the stabilizers. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, so maybe the question is if to track the the stabilizer of, of the generalized case in uh, 
uh, Steve paper. Uh, that would also be, no, but that we know that it gives a magistrate. I don't know, I need to think more. Mm -hmm. 